rise for the arrival of the reviewing party and remain standing as honors are rendered. Ladies and gentlemen, the President and Vice President of the United States, accompanied by Secretary Weinberger and General Vesey. Ladies and gentlemen, honors for General Vesey will now be rendered.
Please be seated. I am Casper W. Weinberger, Secretary of Defense. President Reagan will now present the Army, Navy, Marine, and Air Force Distinguished Service Medals. On the occasion of the retirement of her husband from active status with the United States Army, Mrs. Avis Vesey is presented with the Department of Army Certificate of Appreciation for her own unselfish, faithful, and devoted service. Her unfailing support and understanding helped to make possible her husband's lasting contribution to the nation. Signed, General John A. Wickham, Chief of Staff of the United States Army. Ladies and gentlemen, General Vesey's former division commander from the 34th Division, General Charles L. Bolte, will read the retirement orders. Attention to orders. Headquarters, Department of the Army, special orders. <clears throat> the following general officer of the Department of the Army is retired. General John W. Vesey, Jr. Signed, John A. Wickham, Jr., Chief of Staff. Army. Please be Ladies and gentlemen, our Commander-in-Chief, the President of the United States. Thank you. Jack, I hope you weren't embarrassed by that uniform with the World War I helmet. The way I look at it, you're almost old enough now to run for president. <laughs> but as I say, Jack, don't let the uniform upset you. Because you know, we enlisted in the reserves at about the same time. And believe me, you should have seen my uniform. I was in the horse cavalry. Which brings up an important point. 
You know, ladies and gentlemen, I recently disclosed that the real reason I ran for president was to bring back the horse cavalry. And when I took office, some people told me I was now the most powerful man in the world. So now that you're retiring, Jack, maybe you can tell me why every time I brought up the horse cavalry in the Oval Office, you and Cap would just smile and nod and say, yes, Mr. President, and nothing would happen. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we're here today to honor and thank Jack Vesey for his years of service and de devotion to America. As you've heard, Jack Vesey's military career has taken him right to the top, four-star general, vice chief of staff of the United States Army, and ultimately chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and all of this after receiving a battlefield commission. I know Jack was proud of every rank and command he held. In each, he performed with skill, competence, and devotion to duty. And yet for Jack Vesey, I suspect the title of which he was proudest was the first one he ever held during his 46, count him, 46 years of military service. The one he earned the day he joined the Minnesota National Guard, the title that said, Jack Vesey, Soldier. General Vesey will be remembered for many things. As a battlefield hero, you've heard today about North Africa, Monte Cassino, Anzio, and that grim night with the 2nd Battalion in Vietnam. He'll be remembered as a man of patriotism and deep religious belief, an officer who brought character and credit to every billet he ever held. As a military leader who always spoke his mind to civilian authority, respectfully but candidly, as the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff who presided over the restoration of America's military strength and power at a moment critical to the fate of freedom and his country's security. In all these things, he bore the marks of greatness. But there's one accomplishment that is not there in Jack Vesey's personnel file, yet it's an accomplishment that made the difference in the lives of so many GIs over so many years in so many places around the globe. Jack Vesey always remembered the soldiers in the ranks. He understood those soldiers are the backbone of any army. He noticed them, spoke to them, looked out for them. Jack Vesey never forgot what it was like to be an enlisted man, to be just a GI. Mark J. Neal of Las Cruces, New Mexico remembers, in January of 1975, he was a private at Fort Carson, a member of the drill team there. He said recently that after one drill team event, he was in his residence doing dishes before the volunteer army, way back when Jack and I enlisted. It seems to me they had another name for doing dishes. Anyway, Mark Neal was told the commanding general wanted to see him. He was scared, of course, but he found his meeting and friendly chat with the general something he would always remember. After that, Mark Neal followed General Vesey's career. Hearing about his retirement, he wrote to him recently, quote, this short meeting made a lasting impression on me. It was amazing to me that you even knew I was on the premises, even more amazing that you would want to meet me. That moment of thoughtfulness for a lonely enlisted man back at Fort Carson proved the truth of your reputation as a real soldier's general. There were many Mark Neals in Jack Vesey's career, and Jack Vesey made their lives a little easier, a little less lonely, and he made them a little prouder to wear their country's uniform and defend freedom. Jack, in the five years or so that I've been doing events like this, I've learned something about people like you, a career like yours, combining as it does heroism, patriotism, competence, wisdom, and kindness, doesn't need elaboration from commanders-in-chief or presidents. It speaks enough all by itself, and today I'll let history be your valedictorian, not me. But what I can do today is thank you. On behalf of your friends here today who've had the honor of working with you, and on behalf of some others who couldn't be here, all your fellow Americans, if they had the chance to be here, they would express their gratitude to you for making their lives and the lives of their children safer and more secure. 
And then there's that other group I'm standing in for today. I know all of them would want to be remembered to you. I'm talking, of course, about those young people who wore the uniform for Jack Vesey, had the privilege of having their own GI General. So from all of us, Jack, your friends, your fellow Americans, but especially the soldiers who stood a little taller because of you, thanks. Thanks from a great and grateful nation. May God bless you and give you and Avis many more rich, fruitful, and happy years together. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to present to you a great soldier, a great general, a great GI, Jack Vesey. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. President, uh, you and the Vice President do a great honor to the Armed Forces of the United States for participating in this ceremony today. It's a great time to be in the Armed Forces of the United States. It's a great day to be a soldier. And I hope we've got the recruiting NCOs uh, out around the building here uh, to sign them up after this ceremony is over. And I want to say thanks to the, to the troops who put it on. It's the first uh, military operation uh, that's taken place in the last uh, three years and four months that I've not been cut in on. And concerning the ceremony itself, I've often said that uh, I plan to build an anthology of retirement and change of command speeches after I left the service and publish it as service humor. And I don't really want to contribute to anybody else's anthology, uh, but uh, as I went out this morning and took my jog from quarter six and out along the edge of Arlington Cemetery, I looked out over the city and I could see that the city was shrouded in sort of a pre-dawn haze out there. And I couldn't help but think of the contrast with that view of Washington last night when the Washington Monument, the Lincoln and Jefferson Memorials and the Capitol were uh, sparkling in the, in the harvest moon. And I thought as I looked at that morning haze that uh, sometimes those symbols of the foundation of our liberty and freedom, the principles upon which this nation was built, the principles in our Constitution sometimes get a little bit out of focus as they were uh, this morning in that haze, and we need to reflect on letting them get out of focus and reflect on the importance of protecting them. So I thought, well, maybe I ought to risk being in somebody's anthology and say something uh, here at this ceremony. There's sort of a natural proclivity for those, the old guys leaving to uh, try and give one last lecture, and I thought of that. I thought maybe I should give a lecture to the American people, thanking them for their support for the armed forces and the strong defense, and tell them that that support is needed uh, in the days and years ahead, that it can't be a one-shot operation. I thought I might tell them what Winston Churchill said when he said uh, to the British, we can afford what we need for defense. What we can't afford to say is that we can only afford what's convenient to provide. I thought I might remind them that they won't wish away nuclear weapons, and they won't wish away the Soviet threat, and that as you go to negotiate, uh, Mr. President, uh, with the Soviets, you need a firm defense of the United States as a building block for those negotiations. But I've said that before, and the American people don't need that message, so that shouldn't be the lecture. Then I thought of talking about uh, to those patriots uh, who represent we, the people, in the Congress and uh, thanking them for their support for a strong defense. But I also wanted to tell them that I've listened to a number of their lectures over the last few years when I went over to testify, and I thought I might tell them that they deserve to get maybe a 60-second lecture from me today. <laughs> and I thought I'd tell them that uh, they dabble too deeply into the defense budget, uh, and they get far, too far down into the details and they get lost in them, and sometimes they don't get their appropriations bills out on time, 
And the combination of those two probably wastes more of the taxpayers' money than they're trying to find and saving by dabbling into the depths of the defense budget. And I thought of telling them, respectfully of course, that uh, while they're fiddling around with the notion of, re of uh, reorganizing the JCS, that their own organization for dealing with defense uh, sadly needs reform. And I thought I might tell them in the language of the modern day soldier to get their act together and get on with two-year authorization bills and multi-year procurements and to clean up the committees and uh, stop dabbling in the details of the defense budget and judge us by broad objectives and whether or not we meet those objectives uh, and whether or not we do it with reasonable defense budget. But I've said all that before, so it doesn't seem, to, <laughs> doesn't seem that that lecture would be appropriate. I thought of lecturing my fellow members of the armed forces uh, about the great responsibilities the people of this nation have laid on them and about how important their diligence, their alertness, their teamwork, uh, their loyalty and perseverance is to the security of this nation today and in the years ahead. And I thought of reminding them of the importance of being alert, being ready, being well-trained, and do it with an eye for the taxpayer's dollar while they're doing it, and to take care of the equipment and supplies that have been provided them. But I've said all that before, so there's no need for that lecture. And I thought of all sorts of other lectures to my Russian counterpart about the foolishness of attempting to start a war with the Western allies, or to my allied counterparts about the importance of providing adequate contributions to the common defense, or to my fellow members of the JCS about keeping up uh, the good work, uh, lectures to defense contractors or to American workers about the importance of quality uh, work in the, in the defense material upon which the lives of these people depend out here. But I've given all those lectures, so there's no need to repeat them. Then I thought of all the people I should thank, maybe thanking the Lord uh, for his uh, help, but we do that every day. Thank everybody in the military chain of command from you on down to the lowest uh, private, the one who just recruited, uh, re enlisted today for the help they've given me. Or thanking my old comrades like uh, General Bolte, my World War II commander, or uh, Lux Holbein, who was the chief of police of Hanau, Germany, who came all the way from uh, Europe to this ceremony and helped me get uh, five of my stalwarts out of jail 30 years ago. <laughs> and I could thank all of the security people and the workers in the Pentagon who've made life easier, but there are far too many people to name, and I hope you all know that I'm grateful. I thought of thanking Avis for successfully packing the household goods for the 29th time and getting them shipped off without any help from me, uh, but, uh, or thanking the children for uh, not mutinying for a dozen or so moves during the middle of the school year, but they're all grown up and they know I'm grateful. By the time I thought of all that, my run was about over and I was back at the, at the chairman's house and the first glint of the morning sun sort of silhouetted through the haze, the Capitol and those monuments down there. And it occurred to me that the principles upon which this nation rests are firm, that uh, when you look out there at the Capitol, you can't help but be reminded of the preamble to the Constitution and we the people. And as I'd gone past uh, Arlington Cemetery and looked out over those uh, gravestones there for all the other indispensable people that had preceded me, I was reminded that defending the country over the past 209 years has been steady business, steady work, and it'll probably be, continue to be in the years ahead, and that I had a very good man replacing me. So I put the flag out in front of uh, quarter six there and put it in the bracket and I thought in addition to all the JCS problems and all the undone work I was leaving Bill Crow, I'd leave him that very good 20 buck bronze eagle that I bought for the end of that flagpole. <laughs> so it occurred to me that probably the best thing to do here this morning was give to the, my fellow citizens the same charge that St. Paul gave to the, the Hebrew Christians when he said, let us run with perseverance the race that has been set before us. And then just simply say, Thanks. Thanks, troops.
Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes the indoor portion of the ceremony. Please follow the reviewing party to your right front outside for the ceremony's conclusion. We request that you remain seated momentarily to allow the family time to join the reviewing party.